If you think American food is fast food, here's something to chew on. The original American way of cooking is slow as it goes. Barbecue. So tender it falls off the bone. Nice, beautiful smoke flavor. Mm. It's awesome. It's awesome. You get all the meat and leave just the bone. <laughs> Most famous American foods have mass production to thank for their success. Not barbecue. It's still cooked and savored one bite at a time. And it's not just a food, it's an art form invented and perfected by America's poorest citizens. The biography of barbecue is a story about all of America. Oh, man. delicious. Can't you smell it? Can't you hear what it's saying? Come get me. I'm all yours. Cooking of meats over open fire uh, surely had to be the first thing that human beings ever discovered about cooking food. We know from historical archaeological findings that they were roasting meats 25,000 years ago. In what we now call the Caribbean, the Taino Indians developed a technique of smoking and grilling fish on a wooden frame. In 1492, a few boatloads of Spanish explorers suddenly showed up for dinner. The Indians would put this, this framework over some slow coals and they'd put the fish or fowl or whatever they had shot that day in hunting and maybe with some banana leaves to catch the smoke and they'd let it smoke for hours and hours and hours. It was, it was very different to the Europeans who had never seen cooking of this style. The Taino called their grilling frame barabacu or barabacoa. The Spanish changed the word to barbacoa. By the 1600s, barbecue had moved north along the trade routes to Virginia and North Carolina with help from the locals, since Indians in those territories also smoked their meat on frames. The first meat of choice in the colonies was pork, since pigs were heavy with meat and sheep to raise. Barbecuing cooked the hog all at once, so there was nothing left to spoil. And it was roasted at low temperatures, so that the pig was cooked all the way through without burning. Aromatic hardwood on the fire saturated the meat with smoke, turning even the toughest parts of the animal into a tender, flavorful meal. By the 18th century, the barbecue was an American ritual from Boston to Atlanta. The meat of an entire pig could feed a whole lot of folks, so a barbecue became the obligatory meal for American social gatherings, especially in the South. So you dig a hole in the ground or you dig some other kind of uh, apparatus in the ground and you start cooking outdoors and you can feed a lot of folk that way. In 1769, George Washington recorded in his diary, went into Alexandria to a barbecue and stayed all night. The food must have been particularly good because he stayed for three nights. When the American Revolution ended in 1781, the British surrender was celebrated with barbecues. It was part of every American celebration from the earliest days. In Washington, D.C., when they laid the cornerstone of the Capitol, they had a barbecue. So barbecue was sort of all over America. In fact, as a social event, the barbecue was the original way to influence voters. Uh, buy a few barrels of whiskey and do a lot of barbecue. Barbecue was not an exclusively Southern ritual, but it thrived in the South as nowhere else. And one of the reasons was slavery. It takes a lot of physical effort to move the meat around, to dig the big pits that the meat was cooked in. And because it wasn't done by the white slaveholders, it was done by the slaves. So it was pretty much exclusively done by black men. 
The Civil War ended slavery in 1865, but barbecue remained a family tradition for many American blacks, a kind of culinary magic trick by which the poorest Americans used patience and skill to turn low-quality meat like ribs or brisket into a delicacy. Recipes, cooking times, and other details were handed down from father to son, usually. When I was a kid, my mother actually taught me how to barbecue. A lot of good barbecues are die with the recipe. They won't let anybody know. Different regions developed distinct styles. Texans barbecued mostly beef, and they flavored it with a spicy tomato-based sauce. In North Carolina, barbecue is pork. The sauce can be a vinegar and spice mixture, or sometimes it isn't sauce at all, just a salt and pepper rub. But no matter who's cooking the barbecue or how, theirs is always the best. You don't have people in North Carolina or uh, uh, Memphis swear to their meat, okay? I've been there. I tried it, I like it, but you can't compare it to Texas barbecue. You gotta understand, barbecuing is an art. And if I tell folk all the time, as they're cooking in our cooking process, if you're not gonna be an artist, I'd rather you be gone. Get out of here, cause this is not the place for you. Obviously, claiming a single home for American barbecue is impossible. And yet, every kind of commerce has a capital, and the headquarters of professional barbecue became Kansas City, Missouri. KC's large slaughterhouses meant cheap meat. There were lots of working class folks cooking it. And to top it all off, Kansas City had Henry Perry. In 1907, Perry opened a barbecue stand in downtown Kansas City. Like most barbecuers in his town, Perry was black. Perry's customers were black too, since Kansas City was a segregated town. But at his restaurant, something curious began to happen. He made mention of the fact that he was serving a mixed audience and that people would pull up to the front of his restaurant in chauffeur German limousines and they'd rub elbows with poor black laborers who could barely put two dimes together. When Henry Perry died in 1940, the business ended up in the hands of one of his assistants, Arthur Bryant. Throughout the 40s and 50s, Bryant carried on Perry's tradition, desegregation through deliciousness. Arthur Bryant told me once that mixed groups of soldiers would be sent by the USO to his place. And um, I tried to imagine this black guy and white guy coming together to Kansas City from Fort Riley after basic and they, their pals are going to stick together and then they get farther and farther toward Brian's and the neighborhoods looking less and less good and they get to this sort of dumpy looking place with this great dusty jugs of barbecue sauce in the window and the white guy's wondering well maybe the color of a man's skin does make a difference no he's going to stick with his stick with his guy, he's his buddy, and he walks in and he's in the best restaurant in the world. The virtue has been rewarded for maybe the first time in the entire Republic's history. And then the 1950s. You might think that's when barbecue finally hit the big time. Dads by the thousands heading into the backyard to fire up the charcoal. Well, technically, that's not barbecuing, which is slow and low. Cooking directly over high heat for a short time is really something called grilling. I call them backyard chefs. That's great. I think you need more of them. When you say you're having a barbecue, you know, if you're using a grill and you've got some slow coals and you want to put hamburgers and hot dogs on it, well, you know, that's your problem. But, <laughs> you know, that's not barbecue in Texas. But, you know, if that's barbecue in the rest of the country, well, you know, we can't all be Texans. In the 1960s, Texas-style barbecue came back into fashion. There was a barbecue-loving Texan in the White House. No, not that Texan. This Texan. And Lyndon Johnson's favorite kind of big shindig was the kind that had been winning hearts and votes for 300 years.
It was in 1977 that barbecue claimed the ultimate crown. In the elite pages of the New Yorker magazine, author Calvin Trillin called Arthur Bryant's the best damned restaurant in the world. As a native of Kansas City, Trillin was hopelessly biased toward his hometown hangout with its famous burnt ends carved off the edge of the brisket. They were very crisp and hard and, and burnt and, and uh, ends. They were burnt ends is what they were. God, I still think of them. Make any man weep, I would say. That kind of ferocious loyalty is part of the fun of barbecue. Whether it's about cooking secrets, the seasoning, or the sauce. That's the best sauce in town. The dog is by Arthur Bryant. The original. My barbecue sauce is about as, it's about as original as you can get. The only thing, the only difference is I put a part of me in mine. Today, Americans spend close to half a billion dollars on barbecue sauce every year to make their backyard cookouts taste more like the real thing. For the true barbecue fanatics, there's the competition circuit. And don't so you think we're dying going to hell? There are dozens of barbecue contests every year, 20 of them in Kansas City alone. There, the diehards gather to drink, talk, and cook dreaming that the next morning the judges will pick theirs as the best. It's like a, uh, a ball player hitting that home run or a basketball player hitting like that three-pointer. See that bone clean? That's my three-pointer. <laughs> In 1949, when I went to college, I've said to everybody that would listen, I will never be in the barbecue business when I get back here. I'm in the barbecue business, so I lied. <laughs> Did you know? A life you thought.